session. Okay, so welcome everyone to the last instance of the String Fino seminars before our break. So today we are very happy to have the first talk by Keith Fresh Italiente from Oxford, and he's going to be talking about machine learning, Yukawa couplings from string theory. So please, Keith, go ahead. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, um, and thank you to the organizers for um, giving the chance to present our work at the seminar series. It's a real um, workhorse of string fellow, and their work is much appreciated. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, our, uh, some recent work, um, which we put in the archive a couple of months ago, and some upcoming work um, on machine learning car couplings from string theory. Um, so uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Andrew Constantin, Andrew Lucas, Thomas Harvey, and Bud Albert. Great. So um, the primary question which motivates this work is, is the following. Um, string compactifications, as we know, generate moduli dependent couplings. So what are these couplings? Sounds like a relatively simple question and in practice turns out to be quite hard. Um, so actually it becomes, can we use modern numerical methods to compute new car couplings for reasons that I'll explain. So suppose um, there exists a landscape of geometric string theory solutions, a vast landscape with, with many, many um, orders of magnitude of, of um, we believe consistent solutions. Um, we might want three um, important features in this in this landscape. So the, the first is something that looks like the standard model in terms of its particle spectrum and its gauge group. Um, the second might be um, physical Yukawa couplings um, that look something like the standard model. And then third, of course, is moduli stabilization and Susie breaking, um, which I will not address further in this talk. Um, so we have many Talabi so compactation satisfying this first condition. Um, typically identified with methods from data science, um, like genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning. Um, but you can't couplings are only known in um, fairly limited classes of compactifications like standard embedding, um, which for example, are often less phenomenologically viable. Um, so why is this difficult? Well, in order to compute the physical Yukawa couplings, you need essentially three um, key things. Um, and even the first of these until relatively recently was a big stumbling block so you need the Calabi R threefold metric, uh, the bundle metric, and the harmonic forms. Okay, lost the um, um, and the harmonic forms, and I will address all of these uh, in turn. Um, I just like to put out a big caveat here that this is just a proof of concept, and we're not aiming to you know have totally found a perfect standard model geometric string theory solution. It's just a proof of concept and shows that you know in principle this can be done, and we have done it in a particular case. So um, if we were to get the standard model from 10 dimensional string theory, um, we need roughly speaking three things. We want it to be chiral. So at least um, at most uh, n equals one supersymmetric. Uh, we want it to have the right gauge group. So some quotient of SU3 by SU2 by U1. And we want, we want the standard model particle spectrum. So the geometric realization we choose is a compactification of the E8 by E8 heterotic string um, on a smooth Calabria threefold. Um, giving a 4D n equals one Cairo gauge theory. Um, so what are the couplings in this case? Well, if we look at the 4D n equals one Lagrangian, you have some, um, some the, the usual terms of an n equals one um, supergravity um, specified by at least what we're interested in is the Kähler potential Kij bar and the holomorphic Yukawa couplings lambda ijk. And then if we take those fields, those Cairo superfield C, split them into their bosonic and fermionic parts, um, then we can calculate the physical Yukawa couplings by combining the kinetic normalization, Kij bar, to make them canonically normalized, and the holomorphic Yukawa couplings, lambda ijk. OK. Um, so it turns out in the heterotic string, string um, there are relatively simple formulae for each of these, these objects in terms of um, two or three objects, which I'll, I'll describe now. Um, the first is new new i, um, which is a harmonic one form um, that is associated to each um, uh, superfield ci uh, in a way that I will also describe. And um, you also need um, you need to know information about the Hodge star and also the um, holomorphic 3,0 form omega, um, which is known on any Calabi-Allen form. OK, so 
And in terms of actually calculating these things, the holomorphic Yukawa coupling presents less of a challenge. In particular, it is quasi-topological in that it's invariant under a redefinition of the harmonic one forms new i. Right? If we take a um, non-harmonic representative, so just something in the right cohomology class, um, and then use that to do the integral, the result doesn't change. Um, and also, we don't need to know anything about the um, Calabian metric. Um, so relatively speaking, it's a lot easy, easier to calculate. Unfortunately, the KIJ bar is much more problematic. We need to know not only information about the um, Ritchie flat Calabian metric, we also need the um, exact harmonic one forms, as well as um, the we also need to know the connection on the bundle, which comes in via this bundle Hodge star. So we need three objects, G, H, and new I. Um, so H being this uh, Hermitian bundle metric um, in order to find out what KIJ bar and lambda IJK are. Um, so it turns out to, to find these, we need to solve uh, PDEs on the manifold um, and bundle. So how would we typically do this? So, um, you know, it, if we were in a um, if we were an engineer sitting down and trying to solve a PDE, we might use a, some simple discretization. Um, unfortunately, in a six a six dimensional manifold with non trivial topology, this is not not just um, difficult, but actually the cursor dimensionality means that um, in order to get arbitrarily good um, accuracy, you actually need a um, uh, you need the sort of exponential uh, in the number of dimensions. So in if e already for d equals six, you need a um, uh, a number of points that turns out to be just far too large to put on the calculator uh, on a computer with um, reasonable results. So the alternative um, that was posted a few years ago is to solve the PDEs with neural networks instead. So and to, to reiterate, we need these three objects or three types of object. And we need a metric on the manifold. We need a bundle metric on the bundle. And we also need the harmonic one forms. So I'm just going to briefly touch on um, how we actually do this um, using machine learning and neural networks. So as I'm sure people have seen before, um, neural networks are at least a simplest class of neural network is just defined by iterative uh, iterated composition um, of two types of maps. So one which is an element-wise nonlinear activation sigma, and one which is just a, a regular old affine transformation. So we take our input to an affine transformation apply an activation function, and then just alternate those two operations. And that defines a neural network of some given depth and some given width. This is um, often written in, in the form um, of a neural network diagram, um, which I specify here, where these black lines can be thought as the affine transformations, and these circles can be thought of as the nonlinear activation functions. So some map from R16 to R can be written as a parameterized function f theta, where theta are the parameters. Um, which go into these weights and biases. So just uh, linear maps, affine maps. So um, how can we use that such an object to solve a neural network? Well, we present here a generic method for approximate solutions to any given PDE. So you take your uh, your PDE expressed as, a, as something um, equal to zero, and maybe you also want to add some constraints. And in order to solve it, it turns out to be sufficient to minimize some loss functional of that um, um, applied to your parameterized function f theta and integrated over your manifold x. In particular, um, you simply sum up over all your points, um, which constitute your, your, um, your training set of points, and then minimizing this functional, but by gradient descent in the space of all neural networks. Um, and, and you should be able to see that the unique minimum of this, um, you, sorry, the unique global minimum um, of this functional in theory will be when the PDE is zero and the constraint is zero so that you've solved this network. In practice, of course, it's more complicated, but the idea is relatively simple. So this corresponds to semi-supervised learning and actually does enable us to solve hard PDEs on spaces with non-trivial topology. And this is not a fact that should be remotely obvious, but it turns out increasing the depth or at least the number of function compositions enables some, some nature of generalization, which in practice turns out to avoid the cursor dimensionality. And this is not something that's theoretically well understood, but it's something that's empirically observed. So here's just an example of what training a neural network might look like. You start off with some um, um, arbitrary initialization, and then um, uh, after 100 training steps or 200 training steps, eventually towards 1,000 training steps, you end up with a, um, a trained network of the form um, that looks like the function that you want it to look like. So in this case, it's an indicator function on various quadrants of the plane. 
Um, so we hope to do this, but in, in now many more dimensions and with a much more complicated function. So um, n equals one heterotic compactifications. Um, in an n equals one heterotic compactification, we have some 10 deep gauge theory, which is the low energy supergravity limit of our heterotic theory. And we want to use it to construct our 4D n equals one theory. So this corresponds to some map um, between the two. Um, the particle spectrum and gauge group are given in terms of the algebraic geometric data, um, which we might classify as, for example, the manifold X, the bundle V, maybe some five brains and a Wilson line, and those will combine to give you your particle spectrum in terms of various cohomologies of these bundles, and then the gauge group will be um, related to the structure group of, these, of the bundles. Um, as mentioned before, we also have some um, differential geometric data, um, these Gs, Hs, and Mus, which determine the matter field kilometric and the Yukawa couplings. Um, so uh, how are these two things related? Well, of course, they must be related. And in fact, the algebraic geometric data determines which differential geometric data you can put. Because of course, a, a metric will only apply to some given manifold. The bundle metric only lives on some given bundle, et cetera. And all of this is constrained by the um, SUSY variation requirement, um, which, which will, for example, constrain our um, um, manifold X to be calabi yau form or our bundle V to satisfy certain properties. So um, altogether, all these specify the 40 N equals one low energy limit of the theory. So let's outline a program to calculate the physical gap couplings. What do we actually need? So let's pick a model X, some bundle B, V over it um, with a specified structure group. And we pick, and we didn't need to pick this, but we pick um, that G is SU one to the five, which actually means that we can consider it as just a sum of line bundles. So a sum of, um, of U one bundles over our manifold X and this will be sufficient um, to construct our low energy theory, um, which is much, much simpler than the more general case of a non-abelian model. Then our low energy gauge group is simply the commutant of this um, um, group inside E8. So having established that data, we need to find the Ritchie flat metric with specified moduli. So at this point, we fix our complex structure in Kähler modular. Um, we find the hermitian yang mills equation um, connection um, which corresponds in this case to finding the bundle metric. We then need to find the zero modes of the um, Dirac operator twisted over V, which corresponds um, again, in this case, to the harmonic differential forms valued in V. And then using those three, we can compute Kij bar and lambda ijk just using numerical integration, in fact. Um, and this gives us the tree level you can't couplings at the compactification scale. So without any RG running, et cetera. So how do we actually go about doing this? And well, our sort of motivating mathematical point is um, Yao's theorem. So Yao tells us that um, basically specifying a reference um, metric on a Calabian manifold, so a um, compact to n dimensional Kähler manifold with anything first turn class. So having specified such a manifold with algebraic data and uh, giving a reference metric, we can correct it to a um, uh, to a Ritchie flat metric um, GAB bar uh, just by adding some um, correction to the killer potential, which is actually is a global function. Um, so not just a, um, a, uh, um, a killer potential, but a, an actual function on the manifold. Um, so how would you compute this numerically? Um, solving the, the Mondrian pair equation, which is this one here, turns out to be sufficient to, uh, and, and in fact equivalent to solving the relevant um, um, Ritchie tensor, setting the Ritchie tensor to zero. So we just need to find the determinant of metric such that um, it is equal to some known quantities, omega and omega bar, which come for free on the Calabi R. So the general lesson from Yao's theorem is we should start from some reference quantity in the correct class and perturb it um, by, some, by some correction. And that correction does not need to be small. Um, but, um, and uh, to give us the, the quantity that we want to calculate. Okay. Um, so can we do something similar for, for the yang nulls connection and the zero modes of the, of the operator? So it turns out the answer is yes. Um, so for the, for, the, um, for the bundle metric, uh, we need scalar functions for each line bundle, Li. And the relevant notion of a perturbation in, in this case turns out to be just multiplying by some function e to the beta. Um, it turns out that the result of this equation is that um, if you want to find the um, 
relevant um, connection uh, or Hermitian Yang Mills metric H, um, that's just solving a Poisson equation over the manifold, um, which is relatively um, speaking a, a simple idea. So if we can solve this Poisson equation, we can find the correct um, uh, bundle metric. The matter field couplings depend on um, harmonic bundle value forms, as we mentioned before, which are sections of, of um, a certain cohomology over a over line bundle. Um, so what we do is we can inherit closed, closed forms, for example, from some ambient space embedding. Um, so pull those back to the manifold, and those will be closed. But we can compute the, the requisite correction to them that makes them harmonic. Um, and that also corresponds to solving some Poisson equation, except now it is the bundle valued um, Laplace operator. Um, and there are some source time that you compute numerically using the Calabi metric and bundle metrics that you've, 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 com you've come up with before. So how does one solve a PD on a manifold? Well, um, an N manifold would be consistently defined over patches. So we need to solve the PD over all patches embedded in some larger embedding space. So we take our manifold, we slice it up into patches, put them all in some larger um, space R to the N, right, much bigger than R to the N in, in principle, and then enforce the transformation law for the neural network. That is, we take at some point on the manifold, it has many images, one on each patch, and we just ask that this trained neural network, which takes data from, which takes as an input, some vector in Rm, and we ask that it gives you the same output for each of these points. So U1, U2, U3, and U4 should all give you the same value when you, when you train, put that into the neural network. So you can either put that as a term into a loss, or you can build it into the architecture, and that's in turns out um, what we do. Um, now, suppose we want to um, find a section of a non-trivial bundle. For example, the sigma correction to the harmonic form is a section of a non-trivial bundle. Now, this is no longer true. We need to add a transition function. So the same equation, except now there's a, a patch-dependent transition function, TST. But if you can satisfy this, then phi theta is a good global section. And it turns out we can also build that into the architecture. So we our neural network can be, can be um, a priori a good function or section on the manifold, even without training. So um, let's take our string MSSM example. So what is our string model? We take a um, tetraquadric, so some hyperservice in a product of four U1s, um, which we ask it to admit a smooth quotient, which is what enables us to later introduce Wilson line, which gives us a correct standard model gauge group. Um, and we pick a one parameter family of polynomials um, corresponding to a certain relatively symmetric polynomial, which is indicated here. And the vector bundle V is the Whitney sum of, of, of five line bundles, um, which on these spaces are classified by um, a bunch of integers. Um, and here's a sort of slightly dodgy representation of what the tetraquadric looks like. Um, so this turns out to be a consistent string model with precisely the MSSM particle content gauge group and plus some additional uncharged moduli that is uncharged under the standard model. Um, group. There are no chiral exotica and no vector-like pairs, and it's one of many known MSM models um, um, that we have. There are also some additional Green-Schwartz anomalous U1 symmetries, which do constrain the couplings that we end up with, but that's okay. Um, and the standard model particle content is exactly the MSSM, as we specify here, so it's the usual quarks and leptons. But in the allowed perturbative operators at dimension 4, we find uptight type u -cower couplings. So computing the masses is just corresponds to doing a few integrals, um, but the U1 invariance constrains them to have some certain form. And in the end, what I'll note is that the physical couplings are independent of volume and correspond to this sort of slightly odd off-diagonal structure um, where four numbers specify the three by three matrix. Okay, so we need to specify our losses, which we train use to train the neural network. And these are relatively simple. Um, I can sort of slightly skip over them because they're just, this is just, the absolute value of the Poisson equation, and then you integrate that over the manifold and then um, try and reduce that value, essentially. Um, and this is just the Morton pair equation and then uh, the Poisson equation again for the bundle value term module. Um, we define various measures, measures of success, which are just the integrated versions of those, of those um, um, losses. So how does one compute the Yukawa couplings we're interested in? Well, in this case, it amounts to a stack of 11 feedforward neural networks. Um, each one takes around an hour on a laptop CPU to train. So we, do, we don't need a you know, big GPU set up to, in order to do this. Um, 
we take our neural network, which is three has three hidden layers and is with 64. So it has some sort of vaguely reasonable number of parameters around 64 cube, 64 squared um, parameters. And then we train first the Calabial metric and then the emission bundle metrics, which depend on the Calabial metric. And then we can find the harmonic one forms, which each then depend on the uh, bundle metrics and the Calabial metric. So mm, this is the result. And I show some representative samples of what the training actually looks like. So we run it for, say, 100 epochs. And over those 100 epochs, you see this loss curve comes down, which tells us and uh, this is on a log scale. So it's telling us that we're approximating the um, um, metric to a closer and closer degree um, with a some training set and the validation set, which, which shows that we're actually learning a function over the manifold in general. Um, so the integrated mont jean measure, which is just this sort of um, measure of how well we failed to satisfy this equation, is less than 1%, which tells us that we've done pretty well in finding the, the right, um, um, the right um, uh, solution to this, this PD. So slightly more interestingly, um, let's look at the bundle metric. Um, and so I'm just com comparing two different bundle metrics, um, which we try to learn. So this first one, is one which fails the integrability condition and therefore is not actually expected to have a solution on the manifold. This second one passes the integra integrability condition, i.e. it has slope zero. Um, and so we should expect to find a good metric on, its, on the space. And these have the same um, scale on the y-axis. And you see there's a very clear distinction between the two. So in particular, this first one totally fails to find a good solution, whereas the second one um, succeeds and indeed um, finds a, a Laplacian measure, so a measure of the failure of the equation to close, of around 5%. Um, and that's actually better than it sounds. So this is 5% of the correction. So given that we're perturbing around some reference quantity, which in practice turns out to be much larger than the correction, um, this is actually a, quite a good appro approximation. Um, we can do the same thing for the Higgs harmonic form, um, which um, trains actually um, relatively quickly, and we do a, um, we can calculate the Laplacian measure for each one form, and um, we get slightly worse results than the bundle metric, but that's expected because the neural network is at the same size, but now it has to predict two functions, because actually it turns out sigma is a complex valued form, whereas the other two were real value. Okay, so we now have all this data, so we compute the kij bar and lambda ijk integrals, and use the Monte Carlo measure with, say, 500,000 points. Um, so, we have uh, we take the singular value decomposition of the physical Yukawa couplings lambda physical, and now it turns out oh well because of the exact polynomial we chose these two masses turn out to be equal um, up to numerical error um, but that, that is a function that is something we could have predicted by staring at the polynomial hard enough um, it just turns out to be sufficiently symmetric that you'd expect this to be true but a generic polynomial will break this mass degeneracy so it is not a general feature of this model that you have equal masses. Um, and these masses are in relatively insensitive to point sampling. So let's look at this plot. Um, in the black curve is the trained neural network mass. Um, the red curve corresponds to the untrained neural. So if we set the neural network to zero and just compute everything using the reference quantities, we have some red curve. This red curve is um, a relatively good approximation to the black curve, and it requires no training at all. So the first one requires uh, every point here requires half a day of training, whereas these red points only take about a minute. So again, these are the tree level physical masses for a given moduli. The red curve is only takes around one minute to do it for 100,000 points, and is much closer than the canonical unnormalized holomorphic Yukawa couplings, which are given in blue. So these blue guys are if you set the Kij bar to one, to, to the identity matrix, because you don't know how to compute it. So you say, OK, it's probably around one. And that is clearly quite a bad approximation, but it's relatively cheap to do to, to just guess the, them using the reference quantities. We don't know if that pattern carries on to generic um, um, complex structure, but it seems vaguely clear that it does to some extent, at least for this model. So to conclude, um, we present the first numerical calculation based on machine learning techniques of the physical Yukawa couplings in a compactification of string theory, heterotic string theory in non standard embedding. So modulo those caveats, that's true. <laughs> um, a single full calculation takes around half a day on a laptop for 11 neural networks. So you don't need a big GPU setup or a cluster to do this. 
Um, and the reference approximation appears to work within to within around 25%. And in particular, this enables us to explore the moduli space. So suppose I wanted to achieve a larger hierarchy in our masses, you can do gradient descent in your moduli space and therefore achieve a, um, a larger hierarchy. And so we've done you know, hierarchies of order 30 by doing something like this. Um, and it's relatively easy. Um, we can compute Calabi-Yama to within 5% and expect ultimately expect less than 2% for this particular model with unchanged training time. Um, our next publication should um, expand on this um, more, but I'll just note that um, the techniques um, used here are easily generalized to run on just not on other, ma other manifolds, but other models as well. Um, and finally, the outlook. Um, so there are various different applications we can turn to, but one would be in very interesting is to look at non-abelian bundles. Or, or constraining string models. And there's also applications to F theory. Um, we can look at more sophisticated architectures. And finally, um, as mentioned before, exploration of the moduli space, it, uh, obtaining more sort of generic predictions of the behavior of this, of the masses in this space, um, and of course, generating hierarchies. Um, and that's about all I have to say. say. So thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much for the very nice talk. So let's see if we have any questions from people in the audience. Okay, I think Damian raised his hand first. So please, Damian, go ahead. Hi, Kit, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have a question about the modular dependence of the results. Yeah. How well um, can you describe all these couplings if you go close to singularities in a moduli space? I remember that the Calabi metric is typically tricky to compute this, for instance, with these yeah. methods close to a conifold point. So can you still predict something for the scaling as you go to a singularity for other couplings or how does this work? So that's something that we're looking at um, that we're very interested in exploring, um, but we haven't really done yet. For example, this curve that I, I put up earlier, um, mm -hmm. wherever it was, um, this is, there, there, are no, there are no singularities along this curve in moduli space. Um, so mm -hmm. we're not sure but it would be interesting to see how well we can do. Um, and I've seen uh, indications in other parts of the literature that at least you can, there are ways of um, certain types of singularities, which will, um, which will, which are at least vaguely still admit some kind of numerical um, approximation, but mm -hmm. of course others are less tractable. So yeah, it would be interesting to explore how well we can, how, um, how well we can approximate you know, the bundle metrics and harmonic forms on such spaces, yeah. But I'm not sure. Very interesting, thanks. Okay, so I think the next question is by Michael. Oh, yeah, so I just said that was a nice talk. I just had a question about the uh, Calabi Yaws that have an orbifold limit. Is there a way to, if, when you do with the orbifolds, is there a way to calculate the uh, Yukawa couplings within just the orbifold situation without solving differential equations? and? And maybe compare with the Calabio and the orbifold limit, or, or or that's too difficult to calculate using. I mean, that's not something we've explored, but I mean, I think in principle something like that may well be possible. Yeah, um, but yeah, we haven't we haven't. So with people, but we have the orbifolds. They have the conformal field theory. They could calculate Yukawa couplings and get the numbers. Yeah, using. yeah. But that's that. You wouldn't need the differential equation in that case. You just you just calculate it. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay, all right, that was a question I had. But that'd be a good check though. In some cases you do have a, an overfall limit. Maybe not with the non-standard embedding though, but mm. anyway, okay, yeah, thanks. I'm not sure, but yeah, in principle, yeah. Okay, so one last question from Jonathan. Uh, hi, uh, thanks Thanks for the nice uh, uh, talk. Um, I had a question on more on the machine learning side. Um, so, so in many machine learning applications, uh, one is often dealing with a, a non-convex uh, optimization problem. Yes. And so you often land on not really the global minimum, but rather a, a local minimum or extrema. Um, yep. Now, in this context, what is the, um, is there a proof or a guarantee that you're actually landing on the global minimum or, and if you're not, then how do you estimate how bad the approximation is or what are, what are the convergence properties you know about in other words for this kind yeah. of uh, so in, in practice that's of course difficult um but you know you can write down a very, you know, some functional on on the space which is um um which you know is, is is convex but then when you put it into a neural network um then that functional becomes as a function of the parameters no longer convex in general um right. 
So whilst you have theoretical guarantees in the functional and analytic sense, you may not have, you won't necessarily have that for um, for your neural, your neural network. What you can do is study the convergence of um, your network as you enlarge the um, the uh, as you as you enlarge the network as you as you make it a better function approximator. And given um, that, in theory, you then see the loss um, performing better as you enlarge large network and asymptoting towards zero, you can be more confident that you are training towards a, a global minimum. But yes, it, it is it's difficult to obtain um, you know, theoretical guarantees that you're what you're doing is actually correct. But um, in practice, it seems it seems to be. But you haven't observed anything where it like looked like it was metastably settling and then and then you ran it for more epochs and then eventually it dropped even more or um that, that is, would be like the worst case scenario i could imagine yeah that that is not something i've seen in, in okay the, i see in, yeah okay thank you okay so maybe one last quick question from justin go ahead justin can you hear us can you unmute yourself Maybe not. Okay, in any, then let's see. In view of time, let's go to the next talk. In any case, we have time after the talks. We will leave the Zoom open so we can have time for more questions. So let's thank Keith again for the very nice talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you.